All right. Well, welcome everybody to our online Gather and Grow tour this evening. We're so glad to have you all. I'm Anna Libby. She, hers. I'm the Community Education Director here at Mosca, and um, we've done these series of tours for the past several summers. They've been a lot of fun to explore some gardens and homesteads in Maine, um, and we're so thankful for Lisa for volunteering to experiment with this new format this year and share with us online. Um, I'm really excited to, to learn from her and learn with you all. Um, a bunch of you probably know Lisa from her work at UNH or the Resilience Hub, or maybe you've seen her at a different Mafka event over the years. Um, but I'm excited to see more of her garden and learn from her this evening. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Lisa, and I'll watch the, the chat here for questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I'm sharing my screen. So... You should be able to to see my my cover my cover image there. Does that look visible to you, Anna? Yes, it looks great, Lisa. Okay. And um, just to say also that these slides will be uh, shared with Anna as a PDF, and she can share them with any of you that are interested in copies of these slides for any reason. There's no problem with that. Um, just also thanks to Anna for asking me to to join you, and of course my preference would be to have you all over in person and have a delicious meal under the Great Barber on, on the deck that you can see sort of there in that picture. Um, in fact, some of you on this call have actually done just that. I'm seeing some friendly faces who have had a chance to come visit in person. So I look forward to the day when we can do live in person visiting and garden tours all over again. Um, I am going to start by just defining permaculture because I know that Anna put that in the description and some people will, will already be familiar with it, but uh, it's essentially just a, a, a form of ecological design thinking. Um, it's a design approach and there are some techniques that are associated with it because they're consistent with permaculture ethics and values and principles. Uh, but a lot of those techniques are not, you know, nothing's owned by permaculture. These are techniques that in many cases are, you know, traditional indigenous technology. So I want to name that right away that um, permaculture is, is just a word and it's an approach. It's a way of thinking that can be helpful for some people. Um, and it is part of uh, our journey of how we've come to, to deal with this particular property. I also will say that, um, you know, we, we live, uh, this tour I'm giving <laughs> tonight is of this property that's about three miles from downtown Portland. And we never had a design goal of being sort of completely self-sufficient or totally self-reliant. I never actually thought that was completely practical anyway. But for us, it's really thinking about what makes sense for us to do ourselves here at our home site. What can we produce for food or other plants in our garden? What's being done in the neighborhood and sort of thinking out in concentric circles from there. So just want to be really clear that this particular garden isn't necessarily about um, meeting all our food needs, although we do produce a lot of food. And right this moment in particular, there's a lot of it on my dining room table waiting for me to get canning. So um, I also want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands and waters of the Wabanaki peoples. And um, there's a lot of work to do uh, in to get in back in right relationship with with the tribes and the indigenous people in the land of this place. So. Um, I don't have answers, but I want to say that I have a personal commitment to doing that work and want to have that acknowledgement of the place where I am right now. And just to give further context, a little bit of a zoom in for those of you maybe who are from far away. Uh, we are in southern Maine right here, right near Portland, which happens to be the biggest city in Maine. Um, we're right on the South Portland Cape Elizabeth line, and you can see in that middle picture that South Portland and Cape Elizabeth kind of jut out into the ocean on the south end of Casco Bay. And then zooming in even further, uh, we are in a residential neighborhood, again, about three miles from Portland. And between our one third acre 
and the farm behind us is a wooded buffer that's not ours but it creates a really nice sort of woodland setting to back the garden up too. And just to give you the view of that from the back window of the house which faces roughly southeast uh, top picture obviously the main winter where there's no foliage and you can see right across that field looking southeast we often get ocean breezes coming right across which is a design a sort of a design uh, factor uh, when you're thinking about what plants to put where when you're when you're really dealing with wind and things like that and then of course it closes in and becomes a lot more private in the summer so that's just an overview of the backyard um, we're not quite near in by the sea, but we're not very far away. We're, we're, you know, just a few miles from there. I'm seeing Noah's question. I also will say that we started with some general design goals, nothing super specific, just vague design goals back in 2005, which was two years after we moved to this spot. We knew we wanted to get off of fossil fuels. We were living on a farm out in Waterboro in York County, Maine and really having to drive everywhere, even though I loved being out there. Um, we wanted to produce more of our own food and medicine in the landscape. I also um, trained in herbalism for a few years. And we wanted to create um, sort of a home base for ourselves that could withstand disruptions in the world. So whether it was the energy, food, weather, whatever those kinds of disruptions may be. That's always evolving. <laughs> I think anyone who's lived any place for any amount of time realizes that what you think at the beginning really changes as you get to know the place. Um, and so in addition to all of that stuff, we wanted to create, you know, a, almost a demonstration site or a place that people could visit and see what we were experimenting with. We really love to test out different things. Um, honor the received wisdom of other gardeners, but also just try try stuff out and tinker and putter. I think that's a pretty strong main tradition. So, and we also wanted to create a lifestyle that minimized the cost for us to live here. So while I won't talk about it tonight, it's really been a whole property approach, including how we retrofit kind of an old house, uh, looking at energy, water, all sorts of factors, not just the garden, but tonight we will be focusing on the garden. It is an old house and it's right on the road. Um, the corner of the house that we're looking at points north and we're lucky in that the rest of the property slopes gently south and southeast. That's actually something to work with when you're designing your garden spaces, obviously, is um, where are the slopes, where's the water, where's the shade, all the things that you gardeners already know. We started out with pretty much nothing but lawn and conifers. There were a few deciduous trees, but uh, just so many conifers that even though we're only 10 feet off the road, a lot of people didn't even know there was a house here. It was just ensconced and totally dark. So we did over a number of years, some really strategic tree removal to bring in more sunlight and ultimately uh, we end up with way more biodiversity, biomass, primary production from photosynthesis than we had when it was all just conifers and lawn, but I could go into that nerdy aspect at a later date. Um, there's a question about site information. I'll come back to that maybe during the Q&A, but um, as a permaculture designer, you know, one of the things we always try to do is spend, if we can, at least a year observing and researching a site before we take too much action. So there's lots of online resources about your site conditions and slope and all of that stuff that I could um, add into the materials that I sent to Anna. This is also early days right after we moved in, lots of lawn. Um, there was no connection really between the inside and the outside. We wanted to integrate that. So just as a platform to get ourselves started, we did put in that sliding door that you see there and a deck. The deck splits the difference between the height of the first floor living and the level of the gardens. So we wanted to just be able to cascade right out. That's the southeast side. The sun's out there in the morning. It's fabulous growing. Um, so we needed to connect the indoors and the outdoors. And again, I won't bore you with the details, but while we're developing gardens, we're also slowly <laughs> trying to renovate um, this old house with a roof and all the other things it needed. And we're trying to do that, you know, a little bit each year um, on a cash basis without going into any debt. So um, that involved 
sometimes needing to make some tough decisions around tree removal right in the center of the property was an 80 foot spruce tree literally 10 feet off the south corner of this old house and it was not healthy shallow root system one strong wind and it would have hit either that house on the left or the garage right in the middle and because of its location it also prevented us from being able to do any solar on the house so we did make the decision to take out that big tree right in the middle of everything um, but a lot of it was milled for lumber and used on site and everything else was chipped we try to chip and use every bit of biomass that comes from all the trees that we did remove so really not letting any of that leave the property um, also in the last picture, I should say, you can see leaning against the, the wood pile is one end of a greenhouse. We, a friend of ours in Scarborough got a line on a nursery that was going out of business and had 100 foot greenhouses they were getting rid of. So for a small amount of money and some labor to go dismantle and reassemble, we were able to get one 24 foot end of a you know, commercial greenhouse. And that's what we've been um, working with here on our property for season extension. So we attached it to the back of our garage. And so just to show you there that we did a custom install to, uh, to make that one piece fit on a non-level surface. But it's been amazing and we've had it in place for 12 years. Um, we also had a five-year plan to install all the gardens and do all the renovations on the house and then a baby showed up. <laughs> And so that changes the schedule a little bit. Um, for those of you who have unexpected new members of the family or even expected, time moves differently. And so um, I think we got some reality around the fact that a five-year plan for installing the garden um, just needed to be a lifetime <laughs> approach to gardening and that it will always be evolving. So what you can see behind me in addition to the mammoth sunflowers, um, the annual sunflowers is to the left of the photo, before they flowered are some Maximilian sunflowers. And I really wanna recommend those as a perennial member of the Helianthus family. Um, they come back every year. Uh, they reach great heights. The pollinators love them when they dry. The, the birds get fantastic seed crop out of them. And um, they do have edible tubers similar to Jerusalem artichoke, which is also a helianthus. Uh, excellent for erosion control and also for creating a deer barrier. So I just want to recommend that plant while I'm looking at it right here. Um, in the early days, I just want to say a couple other things about what we got started. We wanted to make sure we were attracting pollinators and wildlife, so we got a water feature put in. That's before it started to grow with all the plants and everybody around it, but a little frog pond um, with the pump and water plants. So I'll show you a picture soon of what it looks like now. Also, we did a bit of terracing on some of the slopes uh, right in the middle there with tiny white flowers is a strawberry field, little field of strawberries built on terraces with swales to catch rainwater. And that produced strawberries for about 10 years straight uh, without any renovation. And uh, we're hoping to, to, to replant that hillside, but that was quite a while ago. Um, and then you can see on the left, there are several posts uh, that was two years after starting eight apple trees uh, in, into an espaliered fence pattern. And I can talk more about espalier, but because we have a small space, we can't do as many big fruit trees as we want. So we thought we would try this espalier technique and train the apples into a fence-like pattern. We also got the grapevines planted right away on that sunny south side of the deck. Um, and we started some hardy kiwis, we got those going, and that is a laughably feeble arbor for a kiwi. I have seen it since then. I've learned that it can tear down garages and houses if you don't take care of it. So um, we still have the kiwis in the ground, but we need a much more substantial arbor to realize the benefit of potentially 100 pounds of fruit per female vine. Um, as some of this stuff grew, we needed to add additional structures. So on the back of the deck, a stainless steel trellising system that then extended over the top of the deck to the house. Uh, all of our garden beds, by the way, that we've created for annual veg 
uh, we're done using the, a no dig method, a sheet mulching method, just layering on organic material, compost. There's lots of good recipes about sheet mulching or lasagna gardening out there. We're on ledge. The ledge is pretty shallow, so we probably couldn't do tillage gardening if we wanted to uh, because we just hit that granite. Uh, so sheet mulching has been great for us. And honestly, these are the best gardens I've ever had. And I used to be a double digger. We had a Kubota tractor. We did all the conventional tillage agriculture and we are very much over it, I will say. Um, these are the kinds of materials that we sometimes bring in. We no longer bring in any compost. We make all our own compost and we pretty much make all our own green material with uh, scything. We don't own a mower anymore. We just use a scythe and mow by hand. Um, highly recommend the scythe supply company in Maine. We do bring in some straw and hay for mulching. We're able to access a bit of seaweed every season, um, leaves from the neighborhood. As long as we know that things are from a clean source, we use those in sheet mulching and composting and, and that's how we build organic matter and a lot of fertility. One thing that's not in here is we have used granite dust freshly cut granite dust. And, and I feel like, um, you know, one of my teachers in that regard is Mark Fulford and there are others, but many of you know Mark and he taught me the value of granite dust early on in my gardening career at this property. So I've uh, been making compost forever as many of you do as well. That temperature, if you could zoom in on that would be about 170 degrees, which is a little too hot. You might be able to cook something in that potentially. Uh, but we do make a lot of compost every year in um, a whole set of bins made out of pallets. And we often will screen that compost and use it for all sorts of things. Our own potting mix, you know, mix it with coir. We are always peat free um, and or sand, you know, depending on what we need to do, we'll mix that screened compost with, uh, with whatever we have. Our other fertility comes from making compost tea, aerated compost tea. So I wanted to share that with you. This is one of our real secret ingredients of the productivity of our gardens. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about these infrastructure pieces before I tour around to some of the plants that I wanna show you uh, and plantings. But we do uh, in a 55 gallon drum, ideally rainwater, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, we put, you know, a bucket of seaweed, some of our nettles, some organic molasses to feed the microbes and really get them kicking off, some comfrey, some of our own comfrey, some of our own compost, again, for the microbes and the biology. All of that goes into a burlap or a hessian sack uh, and hangs in the 55 gallon drum, which we're aerating with a pretty powerful uh, aquarium uh, aerator. And after, it depends on the weather, but after usually a couple of days, that's really bubbling and frothy and it smells quite good. And we will use that to water in seeds, plant material, um, you know, new, new transplants, and sometimes give a boost to plants throughout the season. Um, what not used in compost? I don't know what that means. We'll come back to that. Uh, we did for some number of years have ducks and chickens, which are suitable for a small property like this. I will say that we had Muscovy ducks, which as some of you might know are quackless, very important in a neighborhood setting, not to annoy your neighbors too heavily with loud animals. Um, we did have chickens for a while as well. We took a break from um, backyard animals a couple of years ago, just needed to, to relieve ourselves of some of that responsibility because of other life stuff happening. But while we had those animals, we just had a load of additional fertility, as you can imagine, um, from their bedding, uh, from the ducks, little pond that would become, you know, really uh, nutrient rich, shall we say. And that was great for fertigating some of our plants. Uh, the pond, of course, continued to evolve over time with more plantings. Uh, critters showed up like within 24 hours, frogs, um, dragonflies, we have snakes, salamanders, birds bathe there. It's just an astounding attractant to, to wildlife. And um, it does not add mosquitoes. In fact, it decreases the mosquito load because the critters that eat mosquitoes tend to show up in abundance and keep the mosquitoes under control. Uh, but as many of you know, having your own backyard eggs is fantastic. We are a homeschooling family. So everything we do in the garden or everything we did with the animals 
really formed a part of the homeschool kind of experience for our, our kid. Um, we do lots of cooking. I don't think you can be a big gardener of vegetables without also being maybe someone who likes to cook with them. But um, so we, I think since lockdown started at, in, the, in early March, we've only had one meal as a family that we did not cook in our own home. So we just really like to cook from scratch with all fresh local organic ingredients and as much of our own stuff as possible. Um, so there's just a few beauty shots from the garden inside the greenhouse. We do a lot of indeterminate tomatoes that will climb all the way up. We did, did take a break from tomatoes for a couple of years to do a medicinal crop, which we needed at the time for a family member who was ill. Um, but now we're back into vegetables. Potato, roughly the size of the toddler's head, always an important perspective. Um, Potatoes no dig method is really easy. I mean, I know everyone has their way of doing potatoes, but we have so much going on here that I really love to just have my sheet mulch beds that have never been walked on. They're fluffy. Um, and I just stick a hole in the ground about eight to 10 inches deep in that garden bed, drop my seed potato or my, or my chitted piece down the hole, cover it up with mulch and essentially forget about it. And I get roughly a one to eight ratio in terms of weight of seed to weight of product out of each bed. So if I put in, you know, one pound of, of seed potato, I'll get eight pounds of potatoes out. And, and then, you know, we scale that up. Um, yeah, just a few more shots to give you a sense of what we grow. I also did the master food preserver training here in Maine, which I highly recommend when they bring that back to life and uh, do a lot of fermentation, canning, dehydrating. Um, we do keep two small freezers in rotation. So food preservation is uh, another big part of, of our gardening life. We have absolutely enhanced the soil. I did a calculation a couple of years ago that um, a very, very um, sort of conservative calculation that we've added approximately 90 tons of carbon, sequestered carbon in just our gardens. That doesn't include, you know, carbon emissions avoided by going solar and all the other things we've done. So just really being able to calculate um, that impact alone was really encouraging that we're actually sequestering so much carbon because of the way we uh, garden and manage our landscape. Um, and all the creatures started coming back. So you would think that taking out trees and stuff like that would reduce biodiversity, but it just went in the opposite direction. Here's some of the plants that we focus on. Uh, Asian pear and an espalier on the other side of the property. Um, and I would say if you are in a small space or just starting out with fruit trees, Asian pear is a really nice place to start because they're so incredibly prolific. And they seem to have a lot less pest and disease pressure than apples, for example. So if you only have space for a small amount or one tree, I, I would suggest Asian pear. We have shijuro variety and also raja, and they heavy crop every year. Um, they're just so reliable and I will eat a lot fresh, give away a lot, and also can a lot for the winter. Those uh, Jerusalem artichokes and the Maximilian sunflowers again, edible tubers, but just again amazing late season pollinator value. Um, just constantly, I think every day, unless it's completely snowed over, I'm going out and pulling something out from under, you know, a, a cover or from a garden bed or under the mulch. Um, we have herb spiral right outside the kitchen door because, you know, I never prepare ahead. There's always something like cooking on the burner and I need oregano in that moment. So you have to be able to run out the door and not go too far away and get your herbs and come back in. The grapevines have been doing great, planted in 06. They went up and across the deck and reached the house in 09. And they're variable. In some years, they get a little bit of the ubiquitous mold and fungus that's in the air that often gets even wild grapes. But in a good year, we'll harvest between 50 and 80 pounds and we'll juice almost all of that and leave a ton on for the birds still. We'll just, so they have plenty to eat over the winter. Um, and then from the juice, sometimes we make jam. It just depends on, on what we're up for. By the way, just a pitch for the steamer juicer as a tool. 
I was taught the jelly bag method of processing grapes to get juice out of it and then have it sit overnight. And actually Jack Cortez at Mofka clued me into the Scandinavian steamer juicer. And it was like the Wizard of Oz. How did I live this long without knowing about this tool? Because I, I can go from five pounds of grapes to three quarters of a gallon of juice in about 18 minutes. And like, that's totally saved my life. For a while, one of our neighbors with a barn and a pasture had a Jersey cow and we took a couple of milking shifts a week. So I really, um, I, I long to get back to the neighborhood cow model where seven houses each take a day and we each get like our two to four gallons of Jersey milk for the week. Um, but we would make yogurt and cheeses and all of that stuff. So this is from that time and I'm just putting it here uh, because I hope that comes back uh, again in the future. The pears were shijuro, Asian pears, and it's C-H-O-J-U-R-O uh, is the type of Asian pear. But there's a lot of great ones that are easy to grow. Um, I will also tell you about the carbon sequestration calculation. I'll make a little side note about that to include that in the materials. Um, because I was at the Resilience Hub and we were doing a lot of educational programs, sometimes we'd host things at our house out on the deck. So you can kind of see a panoramic view looking from the back window of the house to a little workshop with Jonathan Bates, uh, Food Forest Farm. And you can get a sense of like super early spring before the grapevine creates enough shade. Here's also a before and after shot of that one angle from before looking out on the lawn with the pine trees. And you can see that our next door neighbors, you know, really getting in on the act with solar energy and gardens and all of that stuff and a rain barrel. So um, some of our activities have spread a little bit around the neighborhood, I would say. Um, and things evolve, you know, like we had a design to begin with, but as you work with a landscape, things change. So, you know, garden beds that we built in 09, those ones in particular in this photo, I had perennial vegetables in there, um, like Turkish rocket and lovage and walking onions and a whole bunch of other stuff. And they got swamped by bindweed. Some of you who are on social media with me know that bindweed is my nemesis and that came, a little bit of bindweed must have come in on compost that we brought in in the early days and it got a foothold before I realized it and it's still to this day will be something that we have to manage to get out. Bindweed roots can go eight, eight to 20 feet deep and so it's really hard to eradicate. So we've been evolving and learning and trying different things in the areas where we have some perennial, I would say weed pressure, even though the word weed is a social construct. Um, we do have an edible bamboo uh, in our yard. It's called yellow groove. So we're always experimenting with other unusual edibles, especially perennial edibles. So those are bamboo shoots in spring. They're delicious. Those little flowers are Solomon seal flowers, which our three-year-old son taught us were edible, and he was absolutely right. They taste like sweet cucumbers. They're delicious in a salad. Uh, this is sea kale, which some of you know about, um, and it's just a delicious perennial kale, sort of cross between a kale and a collard. Before those flowers open, those are like little broccolis, and those are fantastic. So I'm a big fan of the perennial vegetables. There are several dozen that will grow well in the cold climate that we have here in Maine. There's Turkish Rocket, uh, Brassica family, perennial. The leaves are edible, great braised and cooked, but also those flowers are little broccolis before they open. Um, and then the pollinators love them. So even if we don't pick them all, they're covered in pollinators. Do a lot of solar cooking whenever possible. And you can see a rain barrel in the background. We do a lot with rain. Um, do cabbage worms like sea kale? Not really. And generally speaking, we have uh, most of our brassicas interplanted with aromatic pest confusers anyway. So like strongly scented herbs, lemon balm, things like that. And that really helps to keep the cabbage worms down at any rate. This is, um, that's inches on the top. So you can get a, a picture of like no-till garlic does not suffer uh, for lack of tillage. Just nice, loose, uncompacted soil made out of sheet mulching produces good couple inch heads easy. Um, we have occasionally worked with mushrooms and inoculated the chips that we use for our paths with Strafaria and other things. So that's King Strafaria, also known as Garden Giant. It has some other names delicious. Um, so you can, you know, introduce a lot of species. We have done some log culture as well of shiitake. Um, that's from Strawberry Hill. 
we have precocious hazelnuts. Uh, and as long as I win my, I'm, I'm not an adversarial person, but I have a little bit of a battle going on with squirrels right now. Um, Cause they, they pretty much know to harvest these at like 4 a.m. on the day that I've planned to harvest them. So I'm working on my technique for that. They're nice, they're really nice. The precocious hazelnuts are cross between the, you know, bigger European filbert and the native hazelnut to this, this continent. Lots of herbs. We process a lot of herbs here and make various medicines for our own use. Um, the kid gets in on the act whenever possible, of course, as part of homeschooling. So that's harvesting nettles, elderflowers, that's young birch bark, I'm sorry, oak bark that we use for, um, I'm not going to get into medical advice. I won't say what I'm using that for. Uh, these, this is Siberian pea shrub peas. So some of you are familiar with Siberian pea shrub as a perennial shrubby nitrogen fixer, which we do have some of to pitch nitrogen into the surrounding area. And just as an experiment, harvested a bunch of the beans from the pods. It was extremely time consuming, um, but they're really tasty. And I feel like if someone could do a breeding program with these sorts of perennial legume, leguminous plants, to get a bigger, easier to harvest crop, but still have it be perennial, that would be like an amazing project. Um, so just one of the experiments around here. We do have a hedge at the front of the property made of black locust. We did plant it prior to it being listed as an invasive species in Maine. Um, it's native to you know North America. It's uh, probably was here at some time in the past, but we treat it as a, a a hedge, a thorny hedge, to keep deer from traveling through the property. It's highly effective, fixes nitrogen. All of the prunings and trimmings are like the best kindling in the world for the wood stove and the fire pit. Um, and then every few years, we actually lay it as a hedge, English hedge laying style. And so we'll be doing that again in April if anyone's interested in checking that out. Um, we've experimented with some things that you know, some people don't think you can grow in Maine. Some of you gardeners, I'm sure, do grow melons. So, uh, and then we have a lot of local farmers. So when we have surplus, they often will take our surplus uh, and um, be able to move that through their farm stands, for example, or at their farmer's market tables. And some of the farmers around here are also fishermen. So sometimes we just trade vegetables for lobsters. And I think that's a really excellent deal, personally. Um, I showed you our three ducks earlier and, um, three ducks turned into like 55 ducks at one point. Did you know that that can happen, Anna? Yeah, so that's abundance in action. <laughs> and um, this particular breed is delicious, the Muscovy, as I mentioned, and we sold some to, to several chefs. We sold breeding trios of ducklings, um, really loved having them. Um, they were incredibly uh, fecund, I think is the word. <laughs> Uh, the deck has turned into an outdoor space. We use it three seasons of the year. It's covered and shaded and because of evaporative cooling from the leaves, it always feels 10% cooler than the hot summer space outside. Um, constantly experimenting with food. Those are, those are um, daylily flowers with a goat cheese stuffing and panzanella and those are different beets that have been roasted with balsamic vinegar. So. Um, these are foraged pears. We do a lot of foraging of neighborhood trees that people are not taking advantage of you know, with their permission. Now that we, we do grow our own peaches now, but uh, we do a lot of foraging. My favorite apples come from the SMCC campus here in South Portland. It's a Famous apple, which is an old Quebec farmhouse apple, um, reliable every year. And, you know, autumn olive is just so nutrient dense and delicious. I know it's invasive, but it is so delicious. Uh, these are Kusa dogwood fruits, um, Cornus Kusa. Uh, there's just so much around all the time for foraging. Uh, there's Rowan with his first scythe from Scythe Supply when he was little. And um, also just wanted to show that we're, we're trying to be creative as well and make spaces for people to hang out and um, recreate. And even though I love gardening, I also like sitting down and hanging out with my friends and I can't wait until lockdown's over to invite a bunch of you over to hang out by the fire pit or uh, build wattle fences around trees because I think that's pretty fun. 
these are some photos from this season. Um, just recently, I have a mystery apple that I can't identify. Top left, more shijuru, Montmorency cherries. Uh, these are um, Lars Anderson peaches. And the bottom left is a, is a ribes, which I'm not supposed to have. Don't tell anybody. Uh, elder cordial. So the, the biggest pe uh, peppers I've ever seen. Lots of canning going on. I think we're several hundred pounds into the cucumber category. Hazelnut harvest, which I picked early to dry and cure inside to beat the squirrels. Um, just, just lots of images from this past season. Really trying to get creative during lockdown. I made a three mint chocolate chip ice cream with raw Jersey cream from Swallowtail Farms cream and um, almost killed my family. It was so good, I have to say. Just wanted to give you a summary of some of the tree shrub crops and then, uh, and then a few other things and then we'll do some questions and discussion. Uh, obviously we've got the apples. We have ver several varieties on the espaliered fence. We have Asian and European pears, the hazelnuts, peaches, um, we do have two rowan trees, also known as mountain ash, Sorbus acuparia, and I've been experimenting, not yet successfully, with rowan berry wine and other products, but I have to work with that to make it less bitter. There's, there's some value to the product, but there's, uh, I think I need to freeze the berries before I process them. Strawberry Hill needs to get reestablished. We have several pawpaws uh that do grow here um, ours are just not yet at the fruiting age and um, they're growing in the understory of the woods hardy kiwi again i need a better structure rosa ragosa hedge at the front i didn't show you that but we have a double file rosa ragosa which produces beautiful big hips um how much and how many of which thing are you asking allison um Black locust, I mentioned, pea shrub, grapes, two kinds of grapes, the edible bamboo, yellow groove is the variety, elderberry. Um, we have a Stanley plum that we just planted and several beech plums, which are native, and the Montmorency cherry. So those are like the tree and shrub category of crops. And then I just want to say other perennial things that we harvest from this land. It's not an exhaustive list, but Turkish rocket, hablitzia, which is the climbing perennial spinach. Uh, it's one third of an acre, Allison. Uh, air potato, I've tried. Things with asterisks, asterisks are still growing. Things without, I've cycled through and I may come back to, but I don't have them right now. Air potato, dystania, which is a wild celery I got from Jack originally, which I loved, but I couldn't keep it alive. Bird's foot trefoil, sorrel. I have a fantastic non-flowering sorrel that is so delicious. The sea kale, walking onions. I love perennial onions. I get them wherever I can stick them in. Good King Henry, which is in that chenopodium category. Comfrey, arugula, daylilies, the ducks and chickens, of course, we're taking a break. We did have a guest beekeeper here for a while, so we got a share of honey. Ramps, which are sort of the perennial alliums that grow in the woods, they're native here. Water celery in the pond, Jerusalem artichokes, horseradish. So those are some of them. Um, yep, you'll all get the list. Um, I wanted to just end by saying that I'm constantly learning. I mean, I've been gardening most of my life and every year I feel like a baby because I learn new stuff all the time. And there's always a mystery in the garden and just like the blessing of having it during this lockdown is, you know, I can't even overstate how amazing it's been to have the privilege to be on a piece of property, even a small one, to be able to interact with these spaces. Um, this is an item in this image that I pulled out of the ground a couple of years ago. Anyone want to guess in the chat what this is <laughs> before we go over to questions in a second? Um, this is a mystery object, which taught me some humility because I was like, what the heck is this thing? Does anyone? Lufa? I'm so curious. I know. Yeah. Any other guesses? It's not a loofah. Cantaloupe? No. No. Mushroom? No. Fungi? So here's what it is. This is a skeletalized turnip. Oh, wow. It's completely hollow and it's nothing but this sort of cellulosic structure. And I pulled this out after the winter 
when I had not harvested all the turnips, apparently. And I was like, what is this even? Like, how can I still be so surprised after this many decades of gardening? But I just, I, I just want to encourage everyone to just appreciate the mystery <laughs> that is in every single sm smallest backyard or container on your deck or whatever. Um, just to come at it with new eyes and a humility every year. I learn so much um, every single season. I don't know a single gardener worth their salt who doesn't see themselves as the student um, in the garden. So um, this is just another angle looking back at the house, which is no longer lawn and conifers. <laughs> that little piece of grass that you see in the bottom right is all we have left, easily managed with a scythe. We haven't owned a mower in I don't even know how many years, but um, we have great fun here and we feel like it's a really healthy pursuit and um, a really important part of our family life. So I'm happy to take any questions and Anna, if you want to kind of moderate questions that might be coming up or whatever, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, happy to. Thank you, Lisa. I feel like I was walking around your garden with you and feasting at your table. Everything, <laughs> everything looked beautiful and delicious. Um, and I too feel like as, as gardeners, I feel like most of you probably feel this the same way. There's always something new to learn and explore. And um, I love that, Lisa. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So let's see a bunch of um, <laughs> bunch of questions coming in. When are you getting your first cow? Ask yeah. Elizabeth. <laughs> that well, that's good. from Liz, Liz Harvey, who knows very well that my property is not big enough for me to have a cow here. But we do have neighbors, and we're surrounded by farmland. So who knows what arrangements will be made for the cooperative neighborhood cow of the future? <laughs> I think it could happen. Yes, I love that. When you when you have a cooperative cow, let us know we'll do a little yeah. little q a <laughs> session about that too that's right. that's right um so a couple questions came in that you saw lisa um about and maybe you want to just include this later for everyone but in case you want to mention anything about site information in terms of slope and degrees yeah and all that great carbon you've been sequestering in your soil <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, the slope part is some of it's, you know, your observational practice and really looking at a property, again, as long as you can, ideally for at least a whole turn of the seasons before you commit to any big design decisions or garden placements. Um, part of that is seeing what happens in a big rain. Where does water move on the landscape when big water falls out of the sky? That, that is super important data. Also, where does snow blow around in a storm? Um, so you can find out what the cold wind directions are. Uh, where does snow melt last on the property? You know, these are your cold spots. Um, just really doing that deep observational practice is part of it. There are several online tools like Google Earth and other tools that will provide you with slope and elevation. Um, sometimes not as granular as you might need for a small property. They, some of the maps you'll come across maybe only give you like 50 foot elevation increments or 10. So some of that might be useful to you. Um, but I can send a list of the sort of the design site assessment resources that I use um, or have used in the past. I mean, things are evolving and I haven't been do designing for a couple of years. So I'm sure there's even better stuff now. Um, as for the carbon sequestration piece, um, we basically look, you know, what, what I'm doing for those estimates is I'm looking at the inches of additional soil that exist now that weren't there before. Like we've literally raised the level of this property because of all the biomass we've brought in. Um, a lot of it wood chips, like when we build new gardens, we don't remove the lawn, we just go right over it with wood chips in the pads and other materials in the bed site. Um, using the sheet mulch technique. And so, you know, you have to top that material up periodically. So the amount of biomass that we've added and the amount of inches that we've added to this site, um, you know, I did essentially a volume calculation of how much additional soil is here. And then 
a calculation based on the percentage of organic matter. And of organic matter, there's a, a fairly reliable amount of that that's carbon. It's not all carbon. Um, and so, again, using the most conservative numbers I could find, um, came up with that 90 ton number. Um, it's probably more by now. Uh, but for every, you know, one point increase in soil organic carbon, um, you know, you're sequestering a lot of carbon that was somewhere else, you know, maybe we're pulling that out of the air and doing our part for climate change, but it also drastically increases your water holding capacity and makes you much more drought proof. So for us, with this amazing amount of organic material, sheep mulching, not using bare soil, gardening at all, um, even in a drought, we really barely need to irrigate at all. Just a tiny bit as soon as we see plant stress or you know, sense that we're about to approach that moment. Yeah, I love that, Lisa. So inspiring, all the carbon and especially this summer when so many folks are so uh, dry to not have yeah. to be spending so much time out watering. Yes. Um, let's see, we've had a couple fruit related questions. One person has a question about Asian pears. Do you need two trees if you're growing Asian pears? Um, you know, that's a great question. I am not the expert on pollinizers for fruit trees, but my understanding is you will get better results if you have more than one. So we have three and that seems to do pretty well. Yeah. And someone's wondering about your strawberry slope um, yeah. and said you needed to reestablish. Did the slope planting work well in general? Yeah, it was great because um, it was sort of a south facing slope which means you're really maximizing kind of the density of sunlight that hits the slope. Whereas if it's just flat, that sunlight is spreading out over more square footage. Um, and then the slope, like I said, was swaled. So we cut some little sort of terraced swales into it. So those acted like water catchment mm -hmm. uh, systems so that any rain whatsoever or any rain that came off the left side of the garage that you can see there in the picture behind the corn, um, all that water didn't like sort of slough right off the slope. It actually slowed and sank into the soil and irrigated those strawberries. And um, we would sometimes do a compost tea in the fall. My understanding and my experience is that strawberries prefer uh, fertility to be added the fall before, not really in the spring. Uh, and then it just played itself out over 10 years. I mean, getting 10 years out of a strawberry patch, I think is probably pretty good. Um, and just, we've been doing so many renovations and work on the structures that we didn't replant it right away. And it was getting used as a sledding hill in the winter. So <laughs> <laughs> we will we'll definitely get back to it because it's just begging to be growing berries again, so. Well, sledding is another very, very important yes. use, I think. Important yield, yes. <laughs> um, this is a great question that I love from Noah. Just moved to a new house with a couple of acres and just wondering about any suggestions for reading material while they're getting started and planning out. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I really like kind of a, I don't know what level of gardener you are already, Noah, but I would take a look at um, Gaia's Garden. It's not the best title. It's, it's, I think the subtitle is the Guide to Home Scale Permaculture or something like that. So Gaia's Garden by Toby Hemingway. Mm -hmm. And Toby has sadly passed away, but he writes a really accessible book for getting started with some of these sort of basic ecological garden design considerations. Um, Intro to Permaculture by Mil Bill Mollison is hard to get a hold of. It's a, it's a soft cover kind of workbook style. Um, it's, it's a different hemisphere, so the plants are different, but I found the illustrations in that, you know, 30 years ago to be very inspiring to me around just understanding some of the design concepts that, um, you know, a little bit of design thinking up front saves you a ton of work later like where you put your rain barrel in relationship to 
where you want the gravity fed drip irrigation to go. And, you know, it's just a lot of great stuff that I was never taught growing up. So those are some great ones. And um, I'll add a few more to the list that I share with Anna. Perfect. And I'll, I'll just add to that. We've been doing a series of gardening Q and A's this summer and Gaia's garden comes up fairly often as a recommendation. So mm -hmm. a well, well loved resource by a mm -hmm. lot of folks, I think. Um, Lisa, what you just said, I'll just transition to this question. Um, Dan says, asks if you ever feel constrained by the space you have. Um, he says, with a lot of space to work with, I can get away with less thoughtful planning, which is a downside of more. Yeah, yeah, that is a great point. That is very astute, actually, um, because we are doing so much more with one third of an acre than we ever did with four acres and three barns at our old farm. And part of it is just being forced to be strategic um, and designful up front. Now, if I were 20 years old and I had 20 acres, then it, that's almost more forgiving in a way because you can just try stuff and if it doesn't work, who cares? I've got decades and I've got land. I don't have decades and I don't have land. So I have to be um, like really tight with decisions. You know, as a family, we really need to think through where we put things in the landscape. And we have to be a little bit ruthless when something's not working out. Like I may have had my heart set on a particular garden doing a particular thing. And um, nature's kind of a relentless, relentless, relentless negotiating partner because it's like, she'll tell you it's not going to work and you have to just change course um, with it. So I, I actually feel like, you know, I'm still working full time and, you know, I don't spend all day in the garden. Um, we, we, I, I probably could, I love it, but uh, we have to be really strategic and smart and designful. So I think I don't feel constrained at all. I am, I am never sitting at the table going, oh, look, there's all my jobs checked off. I've done everything. <laughs> like that's never happened to me. There's always more to do, even in a small space. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's more of a matter of perception. Um, and right sizing the garden and the design to your desired lifestyle as well. So yeah. Thanks, Lisa. And thanks for that. Great question, Dan. Nice to have you with us. Um, a couple compost questions, always a good topic. Um, you included um, cardboard on your pictures of some materials you use. So folks are wondering about that. And also just how you're managing to make enough compost to right. fill all your needs. Right, right. Now that's great. Those are great questions. I'll start with the compost one. Um, I'm absolutely addicted to composting things. So, uh, you know, anything, anything biological that's not moving is in danger of being composted by me. And so the site, as you can see, can produce a lot of biomass. Uh, whether it's from the veggie gardens or the trees, the prunings. I mean, there's a ton of material that comes off this site uh, now that it's established as a, as a permaculture site, as a going garden with perennial and annual crops. So we're producing a lot of material of our own on site. We do bring in some materials, as I mentioned, like seaweed, um, dried leaves for people who really feel the need to rake. I mean, I don't, but that's fine. I'm glad they do and put it in bags, which is very convenient for me because uh, then I can compost and make leaf mold. Um, you know, we have brought in some materials, but we, we keep up with it because at this point, we don't need to remake these garden beds every year because when we're sheet mulch, when you sheet mulch a bed with, you know, six, eight, 12 different ingredients and it's really heavy and thick and it compacts down into this beautiful garden soil, like it might be four or five, six years before I have to rebuild that bed. And all I need for compost is a bit to do all my seed starting. And then when I'm planting out into the beds, I just need one or two handfuls of compost per planting hole. So the compost goes really far at that point. And it's a really precious commodity. 
Um, we, like I said, we did need to buy some in in the early days to get established because we just couldn't make enough to get started. But now we produce probably three bays, like pallet size bays, uh, at least two, sometimes three per year. And that's enough for us. Um, with all of that sheet mulching, uh, cardboard, paper, the different things that we use to make our sheet mulch beds is a question about slugs. Mm -hmm. And some of you who were gardening in 2009 might remember that that was like absolute deluge of a year. And I think in June alone, there was only one day without rain. And because we're against that wooded buffer, slugs and snails would march out from the woods every night. It was like the Battle of Helm's Deep. And um, that's the year we got ducks because ducks love slugs. And we would run the ducks around and give them a little bit of time because they prefer protein to vegetables. And um, they would eat all the slugs and snails and then we'd shake a little can of their food and they'd go back into their beautiful run in the woods. Um, but other than that, we've been able to keep slugs and snails under control. Um, we just need to keep an eye on them. And sometimes I do go out at night in my little slippers with the scissors and commit murder on slugs, but you know, sorry. Sometimes you get to do it. Yes. What was the other question? And the, um, yes, we talked about the cardboard that yes. you used. So question about, was it, what was the question about the cardboard? How do I compost? How you, how you compost? Oh, I, we don't actually compost the cardboard. We use that as underlayment on the paths. So when we're um, renovating an area or like even in this picture in the bottom left, it's getting a little ratty. The grasses or whatever are coming through the path um, chip material. We would come in and lay down some clean cardboard, nothing colored, no tape, no staples, just totally clean cardboard. We have a few sources for that. Lay that down and cover it with a couple few inches of chips. And we have been able to get chips delivered by um, arborists uh over the over the past you know 14 years we get chips every year to top up with that might not last forever um arborists are starting to charge for chips whereas in the early days they were being charged to dispose of chips so it made our life easy to redirect the supply to us um, we do have a small chipper shredder that we use for prunings when we need to so um We'll, we'll make some of our own, but the cardboard is really only as an underlayment to keep the weeds down um, while everything is decomposing in the paths. Yeah, I love cardboard for that use too. Really helps, helps that pressure on the beds. Yeah. Um, we're getting close to eight here, I think, but we had one question left, which was just if you ever have fire ants that you have to deal with in your... Sorry. Yeah, we've had a few different um, eruptions of ants, uh, mostly in the dry years. So this has been uh, a pretty dry year. And in one area that's quite rocky in my herb garden, there has been a little bit of an outbreak of fire ants and some other types of ants. And I'm not an entomologist, so I don't know if they're compatible or if one will beat out the other one. But it a permaculture way of thinking would be like, what are the conditions that are present that makes this attractive to the ants? And then how can I change those conditions so that they really don't like it anymore? I mean, I suppose if I had little toddlers running around or wee ones that were getting bit by ants, I would take a more aggressive approach. But in this case, uh, my experience is that they love dry, sandy, well-drained situations those ants do, not the toddlers. And um, so I would think about what can I do to change the environment and then they would volunteer themselves out and go somewhere else. So that's been my approach when I've had ants is to change the conditions as best I can. Um, in some cases uh, for clients that I've had in the past, they just didn't have the wherewithal to change those conditions and um, needed to resort to, generally we'd try to go obviously with a non-toxic approach. Um, so, you know, that might be vinegar, it might be um, a fire weeder. I mean, there's various things you can do that are not going to leave a toxic residue behind, but generally start by saying, why are they here? Why are they happy here? And how can I make it so they're unhappy? And um, somebody else will be happy that I want to be here, so. 
I love that, Lisa. And I thank you all for all those great questions. And Lisa, I hope you're seeing all these comments about how inspiring your tour was um, and what a thoughtful garden you have. Um, I really appreciate you showing us around and I appreciate everybody else joining us um, this evening. It's great to have you all here. And like Lisa has been mentioning, we'll follow up with some resources and lists for all of you. And I'll send out to the next few tours we have in this series, the next one's next week of the Maine Heritage Orchard at Mafka, if you're interested in joining us for that one. That's great. And thanks everyone for coming. And honestly, I do hope for the day when you can come in person and lovely to see all these familiar faces and names on the list. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. 